As someone who studies and teaches church history and doctrine as both a believer and a professor, I like to use a website called the LDS General Conference Corpus to more powerfully research what prophets have taught over time in General Conference. One of my favorite features on their website is their chart feature that allows you to see and normalize by decade how certain teachings have been emphasized or de-emphasized over time in the church. For example, type in the phrase, Word of Wisdom, and you can see how teachings on the Word of Wisdom really ramped up during the early 1900s through the Prohibition-laced 20s and 30s as the Word of Wisdom began to be codified as a binding commandment for Latter-day Saints. Or see how references to pornography were basically non-existent all the way through the 1960s, but began to be emphasized a little bit in the 70s and exploded with the advent of the internet in the early 2000s. You can do this for many topics related to the church, but one of them that is particularly fascinating to me is to simply type in the word grace. Do you think that our church leaders are talking more or less about the doctrine of grace now than they did in the past? Well, based on the findings from the General Conference Corpus, the results are fascinating. In all, the word grace has been said in General Conference 1,886 times. Normalizing the references, between the 1850s through the 1970s, grace was mentioned on average only about 60 words per million. But suddenly, in the 1990s, it jumped up to 123 words per million, doubling references from some previous decades. And by the time we hit the 2010s, grace was being mentioned every 220 words per million, or about 14 times per general conference. To put it in perspective, in the 2010s, grace was mentioned at a rate five times more often than it was in the 1960s. The church seems, in the words of Peter and also the Doctrine and Covenants, to be heeding the Lord's command to, quote, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, end of quote. This increased emphasis on relying on the grace of our Lord is coming at a crucial and needed time for many reasons, but perhaps to help with one growing global concern, the increase in societal rates of anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges, including within our own church membership. Professor Daniel K. Judd has dedicated much of his professional life to researching mental health and grace, publishing many times in journals on the relationship between grace, legalism, and mental health among people of faith, including Latter-day Saints. And so we, we measured that, you know, through these instruments that we were able to develop and, and use to measure their understanding of grace and also their experience with grace, their understanding of, of works righteousness and their, and their experience with that as well. So we tried to measure all of these things and then correlate them you know, with measures of mental health, mental illness as well. They're, they're dramatic. It's not just, oh, they just barely made it to being significant. Well, they're, they're exceptionally significant. And not only are they significant, but they're meaningful. Although some in psychology have viewed the relationship between religion and mental health as a negative, in today's episode, get ready to take a fascinating look at how, in the summary words of Professor Judd and his fellow researchers, quote, the data supported our hypothesis that experiencing grace would have a direct positive relationship to mental health, end of quote. I'm your host, Professor Anthony Sweat, and this is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Professor Brad Wilcox sat down with his colleague, Professor Daniel Judd, who at the time of this interview was the Dean of Religious Education at BYU, but has since retired, to talk with Professor Judd about his various research publications on grace and mental health. 
including a 2020 study called, quote, Grace, Legalism, and Mental Health, Examining Direct and Mediating Relationships, which was published in the Journal of Psychology of Religion and Spirituality. In part one, Dr. Judd tells us why he did this study, including his own growing understanding of grace and the churches, along with the findings from his study. In part two, he'll move a little bit more into application and why this study matters for the everyday saint. And in part three, he will tell us a little bit about his professional career that brought him to BYU and why he chose to be a religious educator and is a person of faith. Here is Brad Wilcox talking with Dan Judd. Hi, I'm Brad Wilcox, and I'm excited today to be with you in another episode of Why Religion. In this podcast, we explore the research that's being done by professors in religious education at Brigham Young University, and it's wonderful to learn about what they are learning about and what they have to teach us. And I've been looking forward to this episode especially because I get to interview Dan Judd. Not only is he a longtime friend and colleague, he's also the dean of religious education right now at Brigham Young University. He'll be retiring soon, but I told him, you're not going to retire until we do this interview. And if you do, I'm going to search you out and find you because I'm going to make sure we do this interview (laughs) because the interview is on the topic of grace which is a topic that's very close to my heart. Let's talk now about your research, which I can say is groundbreaking. Let's talk about your research, which I can say is groundbreaking and a landmark study. This is a turning point study, and I just am so grateful for it. I have referred people to this research over and over and over again, because of the topic, and that's grace. Tell us a little bit about the study, and then let's talk about how you decided to to do this research. Sure. When I came back from as a mission president, I really this is 2014. I felt the desire and kind of the being pushed a bit even to to become more engaged in the academy than I had before I served as a mission president, which seems kind of odd. But I really felt that desire. And I'll tell you more about how that ties into our study here in a few minutes. But, uh, but I, at the time, I met uh, a m- member of our faculty named Justin Dyer. And uh, Justin has uh, graduate training in family studies. And he was actually coming on our faculty. He was a part of the School of Family Life here at BYU for a number of years. And yet uh, he looked at what we were doing and we looked at what he was doing and thought, you know, Justin, you're... You're a good match to come and join us. Some would say we poached him. That's a word we use in Southern Utah, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, he, he, he's such a wonderful blend of a man of faith, but also a man of intellect with special skills and research methodology. And my background is more as a clinician, you know, more as a teacher of the doctrine, <laughs> right? And, you know, I've done some, I've done quite a bit of research, but most of it's been qualitative and not quantitative. And yet, Justin, that's his thing. And so I proposed this to him and said, Justin, let's put our minds and our skills and our gifts together and see what trouble we can cause. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's just been terrific. And we had a, a graduate student, uh, Justin Topp. He was finishing his Ph.D. in counseling psychology, and he's also a Navy chaplain with a lot of, a lot of clinical experience, you know, working with the military families especially with a special interest in the grace of Christ. And he wanted to do this and he research wanted, as well. And he wanted to be a part of it as well. So we thought, well, this could be a... And his dissertation was kind of trending that direction, you know? So we all... And he's younger than I am, and Justin is, and, you know, more in, more in, in tune with what's happening with the young... Our students out there. So research, we, we don't want to just write to the academy. We want to write for our students and do things that are meaningful for them as well. We thought Justin could maybe, with his youth and his knowledge, he could bring that could be a gift he could bring to us as well. So we all got together for this initial study. And what made you determine the topic of grace to study? A, a lot of us, I, I'm sure you, I don't know what your, your experience is, Brad, but as a young missionary in, in California, I don't think I'd ever even thought about grace. 
<laughs> but only after a few days on the street, knocking on doors and talking with people, I learned very quickly that uh, that Latter Day Saints saw gra- the grace of Christ quite differently than our than our Protestant friends, especially, and uh, m- more particularly our our evangelical Christians. And uh, so- it soon, I was very competitive. I grew up as an athlete, and you know being very competitive and who wins and who loses. And and it almost became a competition between these evangelical friends that I would meet with and and who can win the the doctrinal, scriptural, biblical debate about grace and works. But it never went anywhere. It just always seemed so frustrating, you know. It just never bore much fruit, those battles that we would have. So that was my first introduction to it. But toward the end of my mission, uh, my... My first mission president turned into a man named Hartman Rector Jr. I could ca- call him an evangelical Latter-day Saint in some ways. <laughs> I mean, a, you know, a very faithful member of the church, obviously. Yes. But uh, but he taught me. I mean, he wasn't a theologian. He wasn't a professor. But he he loved Jesus Christ, and he loved the grace of Christ. And really, he taught me things that I had never supposed about what that meant. And I could see that even though there were some of the people that I'd work with as a young missionary that, you know, they were guilty of what our our German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace, you know. Yes. You, you believe in Jesus and that's all you need. And, it's a get-out-of-jail-free card. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, some of them were certainly, I think, living that way, believing that. But, but many of them, I learned, weren't. Many of them were very faithful, honorable people as Elder Rector taught me, who came to understand, helped me understand the grace of Christ much better than I had. And they were a lot closer to the truth than I was. <laughs> and I, So I'd always wanted to know more. And then eventually, as that story we told earlier, you know, I ended up here at BYU, even during graduate school. I mean, I had a front row seat watching people like, uh, like Stephen Robinson. I mean, he was a department chair that hired me. And the grace of Christ was something... He had a few things to say about, you know, believing Christ. If our, if our listeners haven't read that, that was a landmark book. They need to run out and find that ASAP. And then uh, Robert Millet, who was the dean shortly after I came, who wrote the book Grace Works. That's right. And uh, both of these men were were very very dear friends. Bruce Hafen actually, his book The Broken Heart precedes both of those volumes, where he began talking about the Book of Mormon's version or doctrinal teachings about grace. And so I, and he has become a fast friend even since that time in my work in the church in, the church in Salt Lake City. I came to know him very closely. And, but I've, I've had a front row seat, you know, for watching these great men and women. Camille Frank Olson. Yes. Another, another hero of mine, you know, teaching about the grace of Christ. And helping church members expand our view. Uh, Each person you've mentioned has also had a profound influence in my understanding of grace. And so I'm so grateful that they were able to help you. So what was the study then that you did that focused on this? Yeah, and and I want to mention, Brad, that I want to include you in that list of people too. I mean, you have made a very significant contribution to the understanding the grace of Christ in the lives of, of, of the membership of the church, our students here at BYU, but way beyond that, worldwide as well. So well, thank you. I honor you for what you've done. So really, as a, as a mission president, I had missionaries that, uh, you know, would come and visit with me about their anxieties, their, their despair, you know, their concerns. And these missionaries, I mean, Brad, you've been a mission president, you know what that's like, you know, they... They have they want to so badly to bless the lives of the people they're teaching and their their heart just aches, you know, to help them. But they come like all of us do with with baggage. You know, they have all kinds of challenges and come from all kinds of backgrounds. And half of our missionaries were from Africa and most of these were new members of the church just a year, you know, sometimes fourteen months, and they'd be in the mission field, you know, and I was their mission president. And, and yet these anxieties and, and sometimes despair, they were quite similar across missionaries. 
And one missionary in particular, as he told me his story, as he described, you know, what he was going through, it made me think of, of my studies of Martin Luther that I'd done some years before. And Luther was a young seminarian who came to the seminary, you know, just full of passion and joy to become a priest. And, and that joy lasted about a year. And then he began to experience anxiety and depression and scrupulosity, which is a fancy term for a obsessive, compulsive kinds of religion. Always feeling like you have something to confess. That's right. And, and Luther, he was in trouble. I mean, he, would, he talks about confessing for seven hours a day. <laughs> Not only would that be hard on him, but hard on his, the people receiving his confession too. And they got tired of him, frankly. Some of them did. And he eventually said, he said Martin, why don't you go off and we're going to have you study the Bible. And I think, honest, I don't know this, but I, just having been a church leader and working with people, I can, you know, confessing seven hours a day, I can, I can see their frustration. So that's how he actually began pursuing a PhD in Bible. You know, <laughs> yet he began studying grace and, and uh, you know, uh, the book of Galatians and Ephesians and Romans, and, and Romans, yeah. yeah, Romans especially, and that's. That's where he came to it. But as I began talking with these missionaries, I could see Luther's story in them. I could see their story in Luther. And that's so why I began sharing with them Luther's journey and how he discovered grace and how they could, that really, you know, grace is something they need not deserve even, you know? And God loves them. And, you know, after all we can do, sure, but God can bless you all, the, all along the way. It doesn't come after six months of fasting and, you know, memorization. And six hours of confession. It, that's exactly right. And that's why I love your research, because suddenly you stepped back and said, okay, it's not just about what the missionaries experienced in your mission. It's not just about what the young people in my ward were experiencing. Is this something that others can experience as well? And when I caught wind of the research you were doing— I got so excited and I so anxious to find out what the results were. And now the results have actually been published in the American Psychological Association Journal. I mean, this is legit front page peer reviewed research. And it shows that grace does make a difference, not just for Martin Luther, not just for young missionaries and young students, but for all of us. Tell us about the results of the study. Yeah, we, uh, you know, the, the, the fancy word for this is epistemology, you know, ways of knowing truth. And our predecessors, you know, we talk about Steve Robinson and Bob Millett and Camille Franck and... Elder Hafen, Elder Sister Hafen, Hafen. Brad, Brad Wilcox. I mean, you've done such a great job of teaching the doctrine and, uh, and I think the membership of the church, our students, I, I, I can, it, it's thrilling to see what I understand as being, I hope the, hope the word progress, I, I think I can use that to see good things happening. So as I thought about, okay, what, what can I do that would, that would, you know, add one more dimension, you know, to our, our continued journey of understanding and living grace, you know, For not just me, my family, my students, the church, but what more could we do? And so because things had, had been and are being done so well doctrinally and teaching what's in the scriptures and so forth, well, another way of knowing truth is, is to go about through empirical ways, even scientific ways, if you will. I mean, I, if I had to choose, I'd choose the revelatory and the prophetic and the authoritative, you know, coming from our prophets. And uh, the testimony of the Holy Ghost is the strongest witness that can be given. But there's a place, you know, for empirical research as well. Even when Jesus came to the Nephites here and put forth his hand, you know, and asked them to thrust their hands into his side and feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet, he was giving them empirical knowledge of him being the resurrected Christ. Well, academic research can be a form of, of empirical ways of knowing truth. And so that's what we did. So we identified uh, uh, 635 students, of course, a random sample of students here at BYU. And uh, we took some measures, 
you know, that have been developed by social scientists, uh, my evangelical friends again, you know, helping me along the way, uh, who are very faithful, you know, academically well-trained, who had some measures of grace that have already developed, <clears throat> and measures of not just grace, but also we call it legalism, you know, which is the idea that, that the works will save us. <laughs> and so it goes all the way back to my mission again. Let's look at these very questions empirically and just say, okay, let's see what the research can teach us about the relationship of grace and works, you know, salvation, mental health, whether it be anxiety or depression or... Or scrupulosity. Or scrupulosity, that's right, yeah. Or perfectionism, which is a major challenge we as Latter-day Saints have. But other faiths have that too. Some of my missionaries in Africa were uh, come from a, from, from a Muslim background. And then they have some of the same challenges we do because they're a, they're a works righteousness faith, <laughs> you know? And actually our study says that there, there are lots of different dimensions of perfectionism. There's actually a healthy variety of perfectionism. You know, be ye therefore perfect. Well, that can destroy you if you allow it to go too far. Like President Packers taught us, any virtue taken to an extreme becomes a vice, Right. And we we can do that. That's a part of where some of the mental health challenges we have come from. You know, having been a clinician, having been a, an ecclesiastical officer, you know, I've seen that. So have you in, in your responsibilities where they want to be perfect. They want to be good, but they can't do it on their own. And so we, we measured that, you know, through these instruments that we were able to develop and, and use to measure their understanding of grace and also their experience with grace their understanding of, of works righteousness and their and their experience with that as well. So we tried to measure all of these things and then correlate them, you know, with measures of mental health, mental illness as well. And the fascinating thing is that, I mean, I was aware of this research when it was going on. And when I'd see Justin in the hall or when I'd see, yep, right. uh, you know, when I'd see Justin, well, either Justin, Justin Top or Justin Dyer, and I'd say, hey, what are you finding? What are you finding? Because I was so interested. I call him Justin Squared. The Justin Squared. <laughs> but the, the interesting thing was I still remember the day when uh, Justin Top said to me, Brad, it, it's amazing. Those who understand grace, those who experience grace, mm -hmm. are showing lower levels of depression, lower levels of anxiety lower levels of perfectionism, lower levels of shame. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this That's is right. the missing piece. It's what I had seen in my mm -hmm. students that I was bishoping, but to be able to show empirically that this makes a difference. And it just thrilled me to realize that a doctrine understood <laughs> can change behavior as President Packer taught us sometimes better than a study of behavior. And I was so excited. He says, but you can't tell anybody that yet because we still <laughs> got to finish all the stats. And so when I saw the study and it was in my hands and I realized you had finished it and that those preliminary results did bear out, I tell you, Dan, that was a very exciting moment for me. And I just... I just have shouted your study from the rooftops, and I just have loved what you've been able to do. Now, Justin was telling me that you're still working on another study that looks at, I don't know if you're finished with it yet, but it's showing that not only do these negative behaviors decrease, but you're seeing an increase in happiness, an increase in purpose, an increase in in. And that's another thing that I'm very excited about. Where do you stand in that yeah. research process? Yeah, men mental health just isn't the absence of mental illness. You know, we talk about anxiety and depression and shame, and those are all, of course, critical experiences to, to, to investigate. But it also means, yeah, happiness. It also means joy. It all, you know, th these more positive. In fact, the whole field of positive psychology is taken social science, you know, by storm. And so we're measuring more of those now. 
and we're, we're finding the exact same thing. Oh my gosh! That uh, these are finish all, that study, yeah, Dad. These, we're going to have another interview. Oh, indeed. These these are all tied to those positive things. But that's how these data come out with respect to grace. <laughs> I mean, they're they're dramatic. It's not just oh they just barely made it to being significant. Well, they're they're exceptionally significant, and not only they're significant, but they're meaningful. You know, there's a difference. Something can be significant but not meaningful. This research says that it's it's both. It's both exceptionally significant and very meaningful. For so people. this is a, a vaccine. Yeah, that's working. <laughs> it, it's it's a spiritual vaccine that's powerful. It's Christ. It's God. It's it's His love. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place to check out. Today, I want to tell you about the 50th annual Sidney B. Sperry Symposium. Yes, the 50th. Every fall since 1973, BYU Religious Education hosts the annual Sidney B. Sperry Symposium, encouraging faith-based religious scholarship on Latter-day Saint topics. This year's symposium will be held on Friday evening, October 22nd, and Saturday, October 23rd, 2021, on the campus of Brigham Young University. The symposium's theme is Covenant of Compassion, Caring for the Marginalized and Disadvantaged in the Old Testament. The keynote speaker will be Sister Sharon Eubank, the first counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency of the Church, and also the president of LDS Charities. Many speakers will also be from BYU's Religion Department, some of which have been guests on this podcast, including our own Casey Griffiths, Gay Strathern, Amy Easton Flake, Avram Shannon, Jared Ludlow, Joshua Sears, Crystal Pierce, and her husband, George Pierce, along with some emeritus BYU religion professors, such as Dana Pike, Richard Cowan, and Andrew Skinner. If you can't physically attend the conference, the great news is that all of the speakers' presentations will be made available virtually. In the days following the conference, you can go to BYU Religious Education's YouTube page. Just search BYU Religious Education on YouTube and listen to all of these fabulous presentations. Or just Google 2021 Sydney B. Sperry Symposium and you will find a link to watch these presentations. Visit rsc.byu.edu forward slash conferences to find out more. We've been listening to Daniel Judd on his publication about grace, legalism, and mental health. In part two of Why Religion, we like to get into why this matters for the everyday saint. What can this publication do to help inform and inspire us to live and love the faith? Well, here is Professor Judd exploring those questions, including some great insights on the caution of having what he terms a second mile mentality. In fact, this is this is something that you know, 1995, this is when it began clicking for me, really, what grace, the grace of Christ really was. And you've heard this before, but our younger listeners may not have. But this is President Packer speaking in a talk he gave entitled The Brilliant Morning of Forgiveness. Do you remember that from years ago? Yes, I've quoted from it many times in my classes. Restoring what you cannot restore, healing the wound you cannot heal, Fixing that which you broke and you cannot fix is the very purpose of the atonement of Christ. And so he does that through his grace. And so there are so many things that we find ourselves powerless, you know, to overcome. Sicknesses, physical, emotional, whatever they might be, that, that we've done all that we can and the world does not have, you know, what we're hoping that will solve those problems. You know, think of those relationships that we have that are broken or that you know of people that have relationships that are broken and they've done all they can to heal them, but they can't. I love that you're using the word power. We are powerless and he is powerful. Yeah. I think that's a, a word I will often suggest that students substitute for grace. When they come to grace in a scripture, I say, replace it with the word power, because that describes what grace can do. And I think when we are able to see that power, that's why I love that these young people in the study were able to see grace as a power in their lives, not a get-out-of-jail-free card, 
not the absence of God's expectations, but the presence of his power in our lives, helping us, strengthening us so that we can be healed and we can be made holy. Yeah, one of the significant conclusions from our study is that it really was the, <clears throat> the, the legalistic notions, the idea, and even the, the demand in our minds that we've got to, it's all up to us. You know, whatever the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve, and boy, I've got to do it. I've got to do all these things. and I can do I hard can, things. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's actually what gets in the way of people experiencing grace. So you got to be careful with that. You can take it either way, either too far, you know, but, but it's kind of like an umbrella. It, uh, it, it, it blocks the grace if we, if we keep it over our hearts. <laughs> yeah. you know? And that's what we, you we, found in the study. Yeah, we, we've got to allow, you know, the grace of God to be there. Even, I'll do this with the listeners, uh, if I may. We all know the verse in Matthew where the Savior says, If any man shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him. Twain. Twain. And, Brad, you know, we have a group of second-mile students here at BYU. That's how they got here. I mean, you know, they did it. I mean, they were, their friends were out partying. Well, they were out studying, you know. I mean, these are second-mile young people we have. And I think the church in general, you know, it's a second-mile church. That's how we came to the West and helped the, de the desert blossom as a rose, you know. I mean, We've, we've worked hard, you know, to be able to achieve what we have, and yet that, that mentality has continued in some very positive ways, but some very negative ways, too, because we have that second-mile mentality. Well, the Joseph Smith translation changes that verse. And I remember as a, as a young bishop, by the way, struggling. And in fact, I, I was trying, honestly, to, to save the ward all by myself, you know, in fact, my high priest group leader came one day and said, Bishop, you are the bishop. You are not the Savior. <laughs> You're trying to do too much. Let us help you and, and turn the people to Christ, you know. And so I, during this, I got sick as a bishop. I had an autoimmune problems that came, and I was in trouble. And, but I was, you know, put on bed rest for a month. And so I was in bed, and I was, I was going through the Bible and I was reading the actual transcript, not just the footnotes, but the Joseph Smith translation at the time. And I read Matthew 5, 41, if any man shall compel thee to go, go with him a mile, or go with him a mile, go with him twain. And I read the JST, if any man shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him. Now here's where I'll ask the listeners, what do you think it says? And then if I ask an, an audience that, I'll, they'll say, and I'll say it's a number, but it's not two. And they'll say, three. Seven, 12, you know, all the numbers. Scriptural seven times number. 70. Seven, oh, yeah, that, that always comes up. And I'll say, no. <laughs> well, what is it then? And I'll say, well, it's not in your footnotes. It's one of the footnotes that didn't make the LDS version of the scriptures. When I was in the G Sunday School of General Presidency, I made that request every, every year I was there <laughs> for them to include that. Maybe they will someday, but... But it says, if any man shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him a mile. Now that to me is significant. Now is there, is there a time and a place to go the second mile? <clears throat> are the works that we perform important? Sure they are, all right? But if we're going two miles, when the right thing to do, the Lord would have us go one, we're going beyond the mark. We're running faster than we have strength. We're not relying upon the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah. We're relying upon ourselves, and that's how we get ourselves in trouble. If you are interested in reading Professor Daniel Judd and his colleagues' publication on grace, legalism, and mental health, we've included links to them on our website at whyreligion.byu.edu, where you can get full access to at least one of his articles. You can also follow a link to learn a little bit more about Professor Judd and get access to past episodes and their articles. 
And as usual, we encourage you to make sure you subscribe to the podcast to get automatic downloads of the latest episodes, to share this podcast with others, and give us a follow on social media on Instagram, where you can comment and get insights on current episodes. Okay, we've arrived at our final segment of Why Religion, where we like to talk a little bit about the professor's academic journey and faith. Originally, Professor Judd thought of becoming a medical doctor, by the way, and was in the middle of his bachelor's degree pursuing that field when he had a fortuitous encounter with a patient that led him to pursuing becoming a full-time seminary teacher instead. Brother Judd's going to pick up his personal story there as he was hired full-time to teach seminary. Tell us a little bit about how you came to BYU. How did you get from a seminary classroom yeah. into BYU? How did you ever get, make that leap? Yeah, and so uh, I'd finished those few weeks of teaching seminary in Orderville, Utah, went and did my pre-service training, and then I was given a job, you know, a full-time seminary teacher in Globe, Miami, Arizona. And uh, we had the San Carlos Apache Indian Reservation, too, that was a part of it. And uh, really a, just a wonderful, wonderful two years that I spent there. But I kept wanting to go on for more education and, and ended up in Spring, at the Springville Seminary here just south, south of Provo. And during that time, I began working on a master's degree in family studies, marriage and family therapy. And that was a transition, you know, from from biology and zoology to social science, but but I could I really wanted to do that. And there's some miraculous things that happened that allowed me to be accepted into that program as well. Again, there's the grace of God coming in to bless me. But uh, so from there, I, I, I finished uh, that, that master's degree, and I wanted to go on for a PhD. And so I went to my seminary leaders and said, you know, I, I'd really like to go on. I had applied to a program, Counseling Psychology, here at BYU. And they said, well, you haven't been in the system long enough to really to let us give you a leave, but we, we think it's a great idea. Wait for a few years. But I, I thought, no, I need to go on. And so I went on leave without pay. <laughs> but we had a home, we had children, we had a mortgage, Right. And so I thought, well, I'm a teacher, so I'll see what I can do. So I, I began, I came to the, the religious education here, and uh, I came and talked with the dean's secretary. And I told her what I was doing, and I said, I know this is a wild idea, but is there any chance that I could teach a, a class or two? And uh, she said, well, why don't you go talk with one of our associate deans? And so I did, and he looked at me and kind of giggled a bit, and then he pulled out a file cabinet. He said, Dan, do you see all these files? These are files of names of young men like you who want to teach here. So you need to go out and grow up a bit. And I mean, he was kind in saying that, but, but he was saying no. <laughs> that on my way out the door, you know, to go home and tell my wife the bad news, I was walking by the department chair's office. His name is Kent Brown. And I, I had a black leather jacket on, and so did he. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he said, nice jacket. And I said, well, nice jacket to you, too. And I kept walking, and he followed me, and he said, who are you? And I said, well, I've just learned that I am nobody. <laughs> 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 I just learned that I lesson. I just learned that lesson. And he says, I don't think that's true. You come in here and tell me about that black jacket and tell me about who you are. And so I told him my whole story and what my dreams were and so forth. And he says, well, you know, the associate dean was right. Uh, you, you, are, you are young. You're inexperienced. But uh, I sure wish you well. I think you have a wonderful future. Well... It was probably, and I just kept looking for a job to pay the mortgage, you know, and, and also to go to graduate school and pay the tuition. And But I got a phone call from the department secretary uh, two weeks later, and she said, Brother Judd, this is so-and-so, and, and uh, I'm calling on behalf of, of department chair Kent Brown, and we have four classes for you if you'd like to teach them. What a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent the next three years teaching here in this college while, Brett, you worked on your while I worked on my PhD. And, and my whole time 
And my, what made it so so miraculous is my my research interest was on the relationship of religion and mental health. So I tried to bring those two worlds together. And so every paper I wrote, every presentation that I made, all through my, even my master's program and PhD program too, was all focused on those topics and how they, how they came together. I finished my degree here, but I, I wasn't a full-time professor. I went to Michigan, Michigan State, where I taught institute for four years. Then I went to BYU, called Ricks College then, <laughs> and I taught family studies and psychology there for a couple of years. And then I came back to BYU and been here for 28 years. So wow. thank you. That's wonderful. That, that kind of completes that little story, if yeah, I may. Yeah, it's a, it's a journey that you've been on. Yeah. And in each place, you've made a difference. Yeah, I hope so. Now, you've been serving as the dean of religious ed, and you have been serving on the shoulders of other great deans before you, Brent Topp, Andrew Skinner, uh, Jeffrey R. Holland, I mean, these are all deans that have helped to build religious education at BYU. Tell us a little bit about your experience as the dean and some of the things you feel like you've been able to accomplish. You know, the, the major responsibility that a dean has is to do all that he or she can for the, the benefit and blessing of his faculty and then, of course, most importantly, the students. And so here at BYU, we have a very unique mission in that, uh, you know, we're not here to just focus on academic research. We're not here simply to engage in the academy. But neither are we here simply to uh, do what I did as an institute teacher and, and teach the gospel. I mean, that, that's most important, no doubt. But we're here to bring both those worlds together. And so we are unlike any other institution on the earth where we bring both of those worlds together, both the academic uh, research that we're doing and teaching in the classroom, all to help our students to gain faith in Christ, to strengthen their faith in the restored gospel, and do all that we can to bless their lives. And that combination, you know, of, of the research that we're doing and the restored gospel we're teaching, which is really all the same thing, I think the Restored gospel includes all truth, no matter where you find it, right? But what a unique setting to be able to do that. And that's, I've taught seminary, I've taught institute, I've taught at Ricks, but this is the best of all settings. And that's my job as a dean, to help our, our faculty to see that vision and to really uh, build their students' faith in a, that very unique way that we can do here at BYU. But I'd like to ask you as we conclude about your faith you have worked as a clinician, you have worked in academia, and you've been very successful at it. I mean, you have published in the American Psychological Association Journal, and you have made a difference in an academic world, but you know as well as I do that all academics don't try to blend faith and scholarship. So how are you able to do that? As you'll remember, Elder Maxwell was fun, f fond of talking about becoming a disciple scholar, and he certainly was and is. Our present prophet is a disciple scholar. I mean, he has an MD and a PhD both. <laughs> But he also understands what's most important, and that is to be in a covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, of whose representative he is, and as, as we can be too in our own way. And that's really what it comes down to for me, Brad, is to be a covenant disciple of Jesus Christ. And I'm grateful these last several years I've had the privilege of being hopefully a disciple scholar to be able to serve in my way, you know, of scholarship, to be able to, to most importantly teach my students and to see that uh, learn by study and also by faith, you know, that there, behold, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart. I mean, both of those dimensions are all over the scriptures. 
And that's how the Lord has spoken to me most of my life, you know, through my mind and through my heart, both. And yet, as I said earlier, quoting, uh, I think it was Joseph Fielding Smith, that the greatest witness that we can have is a testimony of the Holy Ghost. It is better than a personal visit. And so my way, the greatest way that I know of discerning truth is through that, that holy, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I also believe that uh, this restored gospel that we're so privileged to be a part is really the solution to all the problems the world has currently as well as in the, in the future. And it's really the last best hope we have. And I know that it's true. I know that God loves his children and he wants to bless us in every way that he can. He sent his son to die for us, to live for us, to, to atone for us, to be resurrected for us. And for me to have some small part of that in the classroom, in the academy, you know, wherever I am, has been the great privilege of my life. And of course, to, to learn what I have, to live as I've lived, and to be able to do that with my family, my wife and my children. And I've tried to teach them these things and to, and to learn from them as well, because these, these, these scientific findings and research statistics, they don't mean much unless you can take it home, <laughs> right? To your, to your family, to your community, to your ward, your stake, to the world in general, wherever we serve. And I'm just so grateful that my, I've been able to be a part of that for these years, and hopefully for years to come in different ways. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat. I'm the executive producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, Professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, and Ryan Sharp. Recording and mixing were done by BYU students Mitchell Bashford and Connor Miller. Say hi, Mitchell and Connor. Hi, guys. Hi. Original music and scoring for Why Religion Podcast was created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.